Hi everyone, this is Daniel, your Game Master and Master of Ceremonies. And again, I just want to say thank you for joining us. We've been doing this, believe it or not, for a long time. I believe we're at year three right now with still plenty of episodes left to go. And I just want to say thank you. And once again, if you like what we do, if you want to support us, I highly recommend that you pick up my book, Faulty Destinies, book one, All the Wrong Places, currently available on Amazon on either Kindle or paperback. Uh, it's the best way you can support us because we take no advertisement, we take no money from YouTube, we take no money from our podcast uh, servers uh, because we don't want to get in trouble with Warner Brothers. So again, if you really like what we do, I highly recommend you pick it up. It is a fun space opera, comedy, romance, a whirlwind romance in multiple different directions. It does get a little spicy, but again, it gets a lot of fun. It's one of those books. Go look it up on Amazon. Enjoy. It's again, Faulty Destinies by D.S. Ellis. You can find that wherever you, well, wherever there's an Amazon app. Um, with more information left to come for more stuff, including an audiobook, which is currently in production. I'm just so excited to talk about that. But, but I'll talk about that more when we actually get to release of the audiobook. In the meantime, speaking of audio, again, thank you for being with us. Thank you for being part of this adventure. And on with our story. This is Daniel, your Game Master and Master of Ceremony. This is Tori, and I play Dooley. This is Sorcerer, and I play Ty. This is Becca, and I play Mirgrat. And this is Odyssey, a Babylon 5 story. Welcome aboard. Seriously, what? Oh, great maker. What is it? What is so funny? Uh, uh, look at me. Look, look at me. What is so funny? I mean, uh, I don't understand you earthers. What? Uh, yes. This is the 69th episode of this particular discussion we're having about the Talmari Celestia. Why is everyone giggling? Oh, grow up! You're, you're professionals. We see that ten times a day. Six on average. But still, we see that every day. There's nothing to giggle about anymore. Ah. You see what I have to deal with? Even the professional actors will continue to giggle at this stupid thing. <sighs> anyway, you may giggle as you need to, considering you're over there. However, I imagine you want to hear about the Talmary Celestia, yes? Good. Sit. No giggling. When last we left our intrepid adventurers, they were making a bargain. It would seem that the, uh, Shadow Association had some information for them that they could get if they were willing to make a bargain. And they took them to a very special, long, long ago forgotten place. A place where near the back of the ship, they were told they would get more information about what they needed to deal with the Eldari and with the Kulati. And here is where we find ourselves in the belly of the beast with a great pact being sealed. But who exactly will be doing the sealing, yes? That sounded better in my head. So, all right. So when last we left everybody, uh, you guys had come back with Babylon Crystal, as it's been come to be known. 
Love it. It had been attacked, and the engineers are currently working on uh, repairing uh, the Celestia after Lokai had, you know, set off a, a salvo, thinking, oh my god, everything on there has to die. And you guys managed to subdue him, do a shuttle in, which included, uh, and the shuttle you brought in was, of course, Dodger, your your friendly, sentient uh, spaceship. <laughs> so, to which everyone then got into the officer's quarters to basically have a discussion of what's going on. Uh, during this discussion, you guys mentioned your adventures, and they were interested and confused, but otherwise they were interested. On the flip side, it had been noting that there was a little bit of a, excuse me, a little bit of a, I guess you call it a gang war happening between two different sides of the steerage area. One obviously is the church, and the other one you guys have figured out is the bugs. And yes, you brought some of your crew over this side, some of them not. Uh, now, Yorni is with you, as is Edlin, because Ed, they met each other at the docking station. Tuvo is still on the other ship, because under no circumstances were you going to let him on board this den of yeah, uh, scum and villainy. absolutely no reason for a fucking ten-year-old to be involved in any of this. Yep. No. So that also means that uh, Mirgrath's uh, intern is not with you. But I believe you guys had taken along Kaluta mm -hmm. as a bodyguard, if memory serves. And yeah, uh, was there anybody else? Uh, Aparo was staying, Chokar was staying, Kali was staying. I, th I swear you guys brought one more person, but just like, boom, right over my head. Eric? Anyway, what, what was it? No, Eric was staying around making sure Lokai was sedated the whole time. Right, 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 right. That's important. So, and, oh, and Padini came with you. That's what it was. Padini came with mm -hmm. you. Right. Okay. Uh, though he left his entourage back on the other vessel. I don't remember um, anybody inviting Padini, to be completely honest, but, you know, <laughs> what are you going to do? I don't think anyone ever does. No, he eh. just shows up. He, he That's the thing about great thing about, at least for me, playing Padini. He is a great GM's fiat because he does not care. He's a pornographer. Yeah. He is, his, it's his duty to go out into these strange places he's not supposed to be doing, so he does not care about you know, restrictions and oh, I'm supposed to actually show up at, or sign an RSVP. Now, granted, you don't want to be rude, but he will just show up. <laughs> mm. He is not exactly a living id, but well, in some ways he is. He is, however, um, okay, there are two different sides a person may no longer give a fuck. Ty is one side, Padini is the other. Mm. I That's where Ty and Padini get along so well. <laughs> like I said, last we left, we got uh, Association, who this moment is being led by a man named, uh, actually I actually have names for this, Jerry Ordway. Uh, he's the guy we met before. Actually, he is the person that way back in episode one, when Julie was trying to score drugs, actually gave you money to buy drugs from the door. He was also there with another with a red-headed woman whose name was Melinda. Uh, Melinda, if I'm pronouncing this correctly, Gebby. But yes, they are actually there at that meeting as well. Hmm. So, yeah. So they have offered to take you down to Steerage, which again means the belly of the beast. Uh, last I said, last I checked, it was also Dooley and Mirgrad who said they were going, and Ty was going to stay here. Now, Ty, while they're going down there. Was there anything that you wanted to do, check out, examine, all the rest of that? Um, I need to talk to Edlund about the information I got from the brain that used to be a ship designer regarding his uh, ship. Okay. That can be done. I got a new read, uh, General. Okay, cool. <laughs> it says bird dogs. Oh, be right back, dogs. Got it. <laughs> Sorry. So anyway, you wanted to talk to Edlin, no problem. While we're waiting on uh, Dooley, let's do that. So okay. good news is that Edlin was here during the meeting. And so once the meeting kind of breaks up a little bit, uh, you kind of say, you know, Edlin, I want to talk to you for a second. He's actually there with Yorni as well. Again, they're communicating a little bit to themselves. And he turns, oh yes, hi. Uh, I was just talking to your uh, the, the assistant, or shall I say, um, Babylon Crystal's resident uh, techno mage. Good on you. So, you have information for me. I'm glad to hear. Glad to hear. 
So uh, he actually says, come, walk and talk with me back to the ship. Sure, why not? Yeah, okay. So basically, as you walk down the halls, and again, you're going from first class, actually, you're going from command through to first class, which is, you know, right there, you know, just straight down the hallway, essentially. Mm -hmm. But you have to one side, uh, Edland, to the other side is Yorni. Yorni also is about two steps behind the both of you as you talk, but they're all, you know, dressed in the usual robes, and uh, Edland just walks walks in front of him, head, hands kind of knitted together in front of his his uh, his uh, his you know belly button. And he says, "So, what information do you have? I'm very curious to know." Please remind me what information I have. Okay, so uh, <laughs> <laughs> I only remember that I have some because that was like right. over a month ago now. I know. It wasn't actually it wasn't that bad. I think, well, eh, whatever. So basically, yeah. what you did find is that one of the brains that is installed in Dodger, which is now part of the hive mind, so it's, you know, again, finding the individual is a little tricky, hmm. was the principal designer of the Marie Celestia in the first place. They were there uh, because of a sh uh, shakedown cruise. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's what this was. This was technically a shakedown cruise. So if there was any issues, if there was any adjustments that had to be made, I believe it's a he uh, wanted to make sure that he, you know, got all the notes down, did revisions so that the next time they were able to build another one of these, it would be even better. Uh, right. That's one of the reasons why, you know, the Maria Celestia has fins all over the place, because, boy, those 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 Centauri love their fins. So what you found out is that technically there is a way to extract the ship from uh, Edlin's ship from where it is out. Now what this requires is A, the outer hull needs to be stripped away. It's not easy to do, it usually requires a lot of people going out with EVA suits, but it can be done. After that, a number of the systems that he's technically plugged into can be rerouted so it doesn't cause any problems. But mm -hmm. it's one of those things where it's not so much Okay, bad metaphor, but it but it helps. You have to surgically remove the bullet. You just can't reach in and go, go grab it. Mm -hmm. And but there is a way to surgically remove the ship from the Celestia, and you've given this information onto him. To he's excited he, because he's like, oh wait, I get my ship back. I we get I get to go and, and, and return back to the. And he pauses for a second. Hmm. Thank well, you. the good news is that we're not really going to need the ships running your ship anymore, assuming this whole thing goes off the way we hope it will, which, you know, eh, eh, good. Uh, so it <laughs> will will be very right. hard to just kind of chop up things around it. We won't have to worry about the other systems. He actually starts laughing a little bit when you go the, well, the way things go, eh, he says, ah, you're learning. And then he lets you continue. Uh, <laughs> look mildly offended that he thinks I need to learn this, but <laughs> <laughs> you, yeah, he just kind of laughs, and, and and you can tell he's basically have, having fun at the, the situation. But he says, "Good." So that means, so basically, if I'm hearing you correctly, uh, while there is a way to get us get me out, great. There is a way, as you said, we may not need this ship for much longer as you have any kind of gestures beyond because you know who knows where everything is now he says because you have that vessel that would be able to support us moving forward or whomever is still around to get us to get them back home that's excellent news excellent excellent yes however um much as i hate to say it i think that our friend who built the Babylon 4 is correct. We probably shouldn't leave this ship just floating around full of bugs and cultists and people from another universal time period. So we're going to want to probably blow up most of it, except for the part belonging to you. So you can't just have the whole thing. He, he, he nods and he says, very well. I agree with the stipulation that we have to save as many as we can. I'm not gonna be here for wholesale slaughter just to get my ship back, but if we have uh, universal um, uh, problems, then I have no problem with those universal problems going away. 
I mean, look what you've done. You found the mat. You found the bottle maker. That is something that even my my group have only dreamt about. You've managed to navigate through uh, slipstream conduits. Something that my ship can barely do. And even then, I like to have a screen in front of me and some several layers of intoxicants to make sure I'm okay by the end of it. Yeah, mm. well, we've just thought, we've already discussed how this guy is clearly not the most confident. <laughs> <laughs> Duly noted, Mirgrat hates Edmund. <laughs> uh, he says, but but still, that is very good, very good. I think I have a few ideas. Though, I have a few things to mull over. Um, yeah, one, so, uh, to, to clarify, what do you mean by save as many as possible? <sighs> like, save as many bugs as possible? Because that ain't oh, gonna happen. No, oh, no, okay. no, no, no. They, they, they mm, will do the right, right thing. And if I'm, if what I've been hearing about this cult, uh, it has, from what I've heard from you, from what I've heard from Yorni, it is something very dangerous to the larger world in and of itself. I know they're looking for a new home, but they have been taken out of time. They can't just be put back. So, and especially if they're going to be this hostile about it. I mean, as far as I know, they kind of bargain for the new bodies, but... Again, from what I've heard from, you know, various sources, how many people volunteered knowing they were going off someplace to die? Um, probably none of them. So, yes. So, I mean, wizards are not are one to be careful with bargains. We know they have always an extra layer of payment when dealing with extra, uh, extra deities like this. So, I have no problems in stopping... The Yithian Rampage. And I have no problem stopping the Eldari. Sorry, the, the Kunari. The Ulati, sorry. The things! Um, uh, 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 <laughs> you were getting uh, uh, Yeah. <laughs> Is it bigger than Redbox? Is uh, things you say to your mom? Things you say to your mom? Okay, pass, pass, pass. Um, but yeah, he says, that I think this can, I think we can work with this. I have, I'm only interested in saving those. He kind of pauses for a second. I'm only interested in saving those who are innocent, who have not been touched by these great little children who are petulant little bastards. Um, uh, yep, right there with you. That was the plan. Good, good. Um, I also have something else to mull over, and I may need to talk to... Whoop, oh, just lost somebody again? Or that's probably Julie again. That was Julie. Okay. Uh, I'll wait for her to come back. I have something else to mull over, but I will talk to Yorni about this. In the meantime, um, I do uh, just want to make sure, while I know that your knee will be with you, and I know that once this is done, I will have my ship back and I will have my freedom again. But should I need it, will I be allowed to... He tries to consider his word carefully. Would I be allowed temporary residence upon your vessel once this is done? Let's see why not. We're letting everybody else come by. <laughs> you can see him almost putting on the imaginary top hat of the way he moves. <laughs> and, come one, come all! <laughs> oh, I understand. But I do understand that some people find techno mages problematic. I'll keep to myself the way I have before, but you are always welcome to ask me questions, ask me for assistance, and I will be continuing my education of Yorni. She is evolving faster than I expected. Yeah, well, so. I'm the captain, so mm, I don't, I'm not going to say I don't care what they think, but it's really not, I, you know, <laughs> not their problem. He, he, he actually just kind of stops, clicks his heels together and salutes and says, of course, Captain, I appreciate your candor. Um, thank you very much. Uh, you're welcome to join us for, uh, I have some biscuits I've been trying out. They're actually different. They kind of have an almond flavor. I don't know how, but they have an almond flavor. Uh, but you're welcome to join join me for some refreshment. Mm, you know what? I've been eating mystery cheese, and you really don't want to know. Why not? <laughs> I suspect Gum. my <laughs> colleagues are going to be quite busy for quite a while, and I might as well wait for them to call me to tell me there's an emergency. Ty, living embodiment of the uh, the of the uh, Murphy's Law. <laughs> you have such faith in us. 
<laughs> so, by the way, yes, he does come up. He says the magic word, uh, indistinguishable. Doors open as normal. And yes, his vessel inside, although everything is black upon black, uh, still has a kind of a homey feel to it. You actually do find uh, a few more chairs have been set up that are also black on black. Go fig. But it looks like he'd been housing a number of people in his ship. So he has plenty of places for you to sit. And yes, you're just in time as essentially his oven dings, presenting, ah, uh, oh, good, they're just about done. He walks over and he has essentially uh, almond biscottis. <laughs> and he's like, oh, oh, careful, they're hot. And he offers you that and some tea, which is actually very good tea. I mean, it allows you to sit and wait for a bit. I like those Narn biscuits. <laughs> uh, there is a part of me going, how do the Brakiri react to good biscottis? Uh, yeah, they're, they're like those Narn biscuits. Really, yeah. really crunchy, but they taste, they taste good. Mm -hmm. But they're even better when they're dipped in just the right uh, right fluid. Oh, Probably please. won't break your teeth like Narn biscuits, but, you know. <laughs> I'm sorry, when you say Price that way. Like, <laughs> but on Darn, these biscuits are a challenge of honor! Um, <laughs> so while Ty is doing that, Julie and Mirgrat head down towards head with Jerry and Melinda to towards steerage. Now, uh, was there anybody you're taking with you or just going to be the two of you plus them? Kaluta? Kaluta? Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely Kaluta. Oh. Okay. Kaluta continues with you. His his outfit is still still sparkling white. You have no idea how he does it. Magic, <laughs> obviously. Beach <laughs> pens and shoe polish. <laughs> Come to find out that like every fiber of his outfit has been essentially scotch guarded to the max. Yeah, he's actually just wearing vinyl. He just like has a wet sponge that he keeps. <laughs> now the vinyl is when he's in the ring. Because otherwise, how else are you going to get those spray on pants? So, yeah, Kuluta follows. Yeah, but in the future, you can actually literally buy spray on pants. <laughs> Sorry, I'm reminded of Futurama with the bikini in a can. Uh, I, right? I mean, wondering... essentially. I do wonder if the new B5 is going to have future tech or if they're actually going to upgrade the concept of tech. <laughs> oh, that, they will upgrade. Again, they were working with the highest they knew at the time, which was, again, 30, 25, 30 years ago. So, but things have progressed. So I'm assuming I think they that... should stick with um, 1994 future. <laughs> it's just better. Well, again, you'd have to explain the concept of newspapers to people you wouldn't they still have newspapers you can just find them on the street yeah well, so anyway now that you guys are here so you're heading down with kaluta and with uh jerry and melinda now jerry and melinda the there is one thing about the association which is kind of bizarre and you kind of understand it most often unless they're talking very specifically about themselves they almost always talk in the plural you know, we will be doing this. I understand. Uh, we understand this is the situation. Uh, my associates and I will be uh, be on the end of situation of this, unless they're saying I was born in Denmark. They will say, "Oh, we come from all over." You know that sort of thing. They always talk in the collective. That's um, because they're too used to being part of a collective. Like you know, Mirgorat finds nothing odd about this. <laughs> Mirgrat probably finds it kind of homey. You know, just normal oh. stuff. You know. They have, a, they, in other words, from Mirgrat's perspective, these people have a different way of observing the churn so that it gets a little, you know, how they preserve it is their own, own business. But again, they see how things would eventually come together. Fascinating. But the other thing about these two, as you can tell, besides the fact that they're quiet when they need to be quiet, but when they're not, they just talk. And it's not like, you know, talk about the weather or anything else like that. It's like, you ever hang around phil uh, philosophy majors for any extended period of time, and you just wait for that moment when they're just drunk enough that they they uh, they just start talking about whatever they've been re uh, reading recently? Yes. Not I prefer sure. not to hang around philosophy majors because I'm tempted to do violence. 
So, yeah. So you have two people who will discuss amongst themselves not philosophy, but everything from economics to scientific development to whatever they've been able to, to discover recently, and, but definitely a lot of more business related. I guess it's more like listening to stockbrokers from the 80s than it is philosophy majors, but you get the idea. Yeah, I don't do that either. Just yeah, like, yeah, I, I, I know exactly what you mean. Living in Charlotte, <laughs> business for yeah. central. I mean, and I actually used to live in the New York area in the 80s, and my dad was a stock bro was a commodities broker. So I got to meet these people. They only have um, one topic of conversation. <laughs> so, you know, you go down and you talk to them. Is there anything you want to ask of them, or do you just let them talk amongst themselves and just kind of keep a distance? I let them talk amongst themselves, but instead of keeping a distance, I am avidly listening to what they're saying and, and making notes. Okay. Uh, go ahead and give why, me... Why are they here again? Why are they here in which in which sense? Like, why are they here with us going to the same place we're going? Oh, because they're the ones leading you to it. Oh, okay. So they're our guides. Got it. Essentially, That's yes. actually terrifying. Um, uh, the okay. other part is, go on, is that... Go <laughs> yeah. yeah. Mirgrat, can I get a... Ooh. Uh, they don't do listen anymore. I believe it's... Can I get a intrigue check? Yes. Uh, is this to gather information? Essentially, yes. You're you're okay. overhearing and listening and see what you can dish out. Sixteen. All right, sixteen. So you don't get a lot, and a lot of what the stuff they're saying sounds very reasonable, but it's one of those things that if you don't know the context of what they're speaking, it's almost gibberish. But there's enough there to understand that it's not gibberish. I mean, um, I've had a lot of conversations like that with my friends. I'm not judging. Yeah, it's okay. <laughs> so it's not quite the level of, um, you know, it's not quite the level of, uh, what was it? Gilgamesh and Inkadu at the gates. Um, <laughs> it's <laughs> at Tanagra. Oh, um, Thermok and Jalad at Tanagra? Yes, yeah. 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 yeah I couldn't re the name couldn't quite come to, come, come to mind right now. Which probably means I need to go get my brain checked. Or but yeah, watch the show again. <sighs> or get your I, brain checked. <laughs> I can do both. Or just uh, do that one Picard song. <laughs> <laughs> so, but yeah, it's kind of like that. But it's again, it's like dealing with brokers or philosophy people that if you don't understand what they're talking about, it makes almost no sense, but the pattern is there to recognize that it makes sense to them. Yeah, it's just jargon. Yeah. But the funny thing is, both of you gave me a notice check. Oh, hell yeah, I'm good at those now. <laughs> 20. 20, not bad. Julie, 22. 22. Nice. Ooh. So here's the thing you both notice. Um, there's very definitely what might be considered three groups in steerage. There is obviously the church. There is obviously, they don't call themselves the bugs, but basically, how to put this? Um, people know them by, they don't look and act and sound like they're good. They're, they're falling into the uncanny candy valley just enough how they move, how they walk, how they talk, that they give off that vibe of, ew. Having been body are, snatched? Yeah, essentially, yeah. yeah. I didn't, unfortunately forgot to come up with a colloquialism that everybody else would call them because the fact that they have bugs in their skull isn't exactly known. Hi, people. Yeah. It's a little too on yeah. the news, but you know, it's the <laughs> 90s future, so uh, yeah. that movie would be fairly fresh in the 90s future's mind, presumably. Well, Pod people are, have been known for years, so there's that. But yeah, so basically pod people are kind of people go, eh, something wrong with them. They could be androids, they could be something, have some sort of disease, but nobody knows. Something they do recognize is that many of them have red crystals, usually in some sort of tool, like a scanner, a knife, uh, something else like that. But they tend to have a small little red crystal near them or on them. Again, very strange, nobody knows why just in the same way that the church tend to have a little blue crystal somewhere on them. 
However, I'm sorry. Were... Did you set up this entire thing so you could have red versus blue? Not, <laughs> not essentially. It's not just red versus blue. Remember, there is a yellow in this as well. This all started with amber. We love primary colors. Hey! Uh, <laughs> primary colors, ho! Uh, I am a big fan of, of Green Lantern and all the different lantern cores, so I get into color theory. Anyway, um, the I just love colors. Fair enough. <laughs> There's a third group, which is essentially everybody else. Now, the good news is, uh, as you look around, the everybody else still vastly outnumbers the other two groups. However, much like as, the, a, it, as a majority or a plurality, because that's important. Um, give me another notice check. <laughs> mm-hmm. Seventeen. Okay. We're rolling real bad today. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Luckily, I'm good at notice checks now. In this case, even with the seventeen, you suspect that it's a majority, but you can't quite tell. It's Again, the only things that come to mind as examples are Wild West movies or samurai movies, where the number of, quote, peasants is more than the members of the White Hats and the Black Hats, or this samurai faction and that samurai faction, or the ninjas versus samurais. But where they go, things tend to go their way. Noted. You know what I mean? Yes. Yeah. However, everybody, well, it's very obvious that if you do run across a church faction or a pod people faction, when they see Jerry and Melinda parting in the Red Sea, mm. you know, it is very much the, they don't bow and scrape, but there's definitely that, you know, the warlords will nod their heads at them as they pass. To they which, don't bow and scrape, but they would if they thought it would help something like that. It's more of a sign of respect. We're not going to prostrate ourselves because that's degrading, but we recognize who is keeping control here. You you always say hi to to the overlord. And Fair. that seems to be as far as you can tell, the association somehow or just these two. Who knows? But the way through is very long and you realize pretty quickly that not only are you into steerage, you're in deep, deep steerage. I mean, as in, if you were to go any further, you would be an engine core. And that's when he rounds a particular corner. I'm going to let both Dooley and Mirgrath make intelligence checks, please. Hell yeah. Yes. Uh, Still rolling badly, but this time it's good. And yes. Dooley, you have a 17, so you did good? Yeah. yeah. All of a sudden, when you turn a corner, you go... Wait a minute. Steerage. Back by the engines. As far back. Oh, God. Are we? Yes. You approach the door. The black door. Oh, I'm going to get a memory refresher on that one. Yeah. This is, I'm uh, yeah, this is from all, my brain. all the way back. <laughs> okay. Yeah, no, we haven't, we haven't dealt with the door in, in months, but that's okay. This is where the gang that was distributing the amber was located, where the Markhab used to be, the one who was the ancient one of the last of his kind, who was taking in antiques, relics, and so forth, and distributing amber, uh, that when uh, Mirgrat was possessed, came and ate the Markhab, and then proceeded to eat a few of the other books that he, the Markhab, had laying around or try to eat some of the books uh, there was some discussion with with and some control battle that happened between Mirgrat and uh, sorry i missed all of that my discord shorted out oh, okay sorry sorry uh, <laughs> uh where did where did you leave off uh i didn't hear anything after i said i don't think Mirgrat had anything to do with that door yeah okay, it was just yes, you it was just tie into Okay. No, no, no. Mirgrat actually went through that door because while Mirgrat was possessed, that was the door where the Markhab lived, where you ki- uh, where the entity inside of inside of Mirgrat killed the Markhab, ate him, uh, and and tried to eat a couple of the books 
when you and the entity fought for control to make sure it didn't destroy any more information. Ah, uh, yes. So, yeah, this is where the gang had been. Now, the gang had been gone for a while because the Eldari had left and absorbed almost everybody who had touched Amber into a vessel because, ew. And so that room, the whole office there was essentially left untouched. And when Jerry comes up, he punches a couple of numbers into the keypad, door opens up, and he walks in. And so does Belinda. And they're like, please, come, come. I mean, Mirat goes. It's not like they're going to, like, quit at this point. Fair enough. Yeah, but uh, I'm definitely hovering a hand near the, uh, the gun. Near your that firearm? I, yeah. I'm trying to remember which one I have. Uh, I have, have a PPG. PPG. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so, I have a. I I am not worried because I have a. Uh, I have a dual phase PPG f- pistol, which does more damage than a regular PPG pistol because the Pakmara are really good at plasma technology. The funny thing is, I think you've had it in your robe somewhere the entire time and just yes. never actually pulled it. I have never used it. it. I have been armed this entire time. Which would have been great because this would be make it an anti Chekhov's gun should you ever shoot it. <laughs> <laughs> so when you go in there, it's not as busy as it once was, but then again, all the gang had left many you know a long time ago. So that is not to be, you know, to be expected. But there are one or two people in there, and they're in essentially association outfits, which is a nice looking suit, tends to be black. Um colored shirts for both men and women uh but no or sorry colorless because that's how they did things back then no tie but again more suit jacket more you know standard pants but a couple of them are going through indexing researching reading the various articles and artifacts that are around i approve he says uh this seems to be i believe what you're dealing with in some ways but we have some more information over here he opens up the back room and this one is specific. Mirgrat, I will need a notice check. I'll get one for okay. delete too. Go ahead and roll notice real quick. Twenty-seven. Twenty. Oh, and thirty-one. Wow. Yeah. Nice. So um, we're we're very aware just of the fact that we we've both gone paranoid. <laughs> <laughs> now, one thing is the smell. Which for uh, Julie is just the oh god what is that stench, whereas for Mirgrad is hmm that's that, that smells lovely. There's um, a in here and there. Flesh. Is, they let apparently whoever was here last or wasn't here last kind of let the Markab rot, and he's been disposed of, but that smell is still in the air. You know again. It's like somebody had closed the door on this place and let it sit for about two or three weeks or a month, then opened it up and, you know, got the body out. So, I mean, that happens. <laughs> so basically... I, I, I'm going to take a moment to lean over to Mirgrat and say, um, remind me, we might want to find some new food sources for you before the long trip. That is an excellent idea! I am hungry all of a sudden. <laughs> I can't help you at this moment. <laughs> all I keep thinking here is, anyway, here in my head sorry, is, Dad. Is, is like, that's okay. It's okay. This is fun part. Go talk <laughs> amongst yourself. Um, <laughs> I actually have this image in my head of just uh, like the line, you know, if Mirakai goes, hmm, who's in the mood for Italian? I thought you were Italian. <laughs> <laughs> that is bad. Very, very bad. <laughs> This is why Ty didn't come on this trip. <laughs> <laughs> the possibility of corpses. Uh, I mean, yeah. Specifically hers, but, you know, other corpses as well. <laughs> In general, unless you're of certain occupations, corpses are to be avoided for a lot of reasons, including mm-hmm. your own, you know. So, but he takes a moment. He actually... 
uh, grabs, like, there's this countertop, a little bowl, and it's a bowl that you would expect to find either jelly beans or uh, earplugs, or if you're in certain circles, a bowl full of condoms. But he actually just reaches over, grabs a couple of these, like, bead things, and proceeds to, like, unwrap them a little bit and shove them up his nose. And he's like, better. And he walks forward. You realize that, again, that smell of decay and, and death isn't subtle. And for the humans in the group, while they don't have the best sniffers in the world compared to a lot of other species, they notice it too, and they find it a little annoying. So they have a whole bowl full of nose plucks. Nose I thought you were beads. describing, like, scent beads. Yeah. Like they just had a bowl of, like, scent beads that they just found and were just jamming them in their fucking noses. <laughs> oh, I it was just, like, like uh, camphor or vapor rub or something. Yeah. That's even worse. <laughs> that's, what they do. that's what they did in uh, uh, Silence of the Lambs, right? That little rub of camphor under the nose? Mm-hmm. So, uh, but yeah, if these are closer to, like, air, filter, elf, air filtration plugs. So they just kind of, you know, shove them up their nose. But he goes around and he's... he's goes back to the desk. Now the desk again, still looks like it's a little bit disarranged from uh, Mirgrat's issues there at last, but people had to try to put things together. You're also noticing that there were several other, I guess you could call them closet spaces or auxiliary rooms from this room, which were, now the, the doors are now open. You didn't even notice them as doors last time, so this place is even larger than you thought. And inside are shelving units. Now, the best way I call this a closet, but it's not like your standard, here's a bar, take a shirt out closet. These are closer to walk-in closets, which uh, have shelving units in them. And the shelving units are filled with ancient relics. Now, there are several of them that have empty spots, several of them that have notice tags, but nothing in them. And the whole room is still, they have, Things that to an untrained observer kind of looks like old junk, but to someone like the librarian is um, like walking into a museum and to someone like Dooley, who has spent time amongst various criminal organizations back in the day, would see as, oh, trade goods of some collector variety. You know, it's kind of like that scene from Falcon and the Winter Soldier where they meet the power broker and they have paintings from everywhere and they're like oh yeah every place else has fakes these are the real ones it's that same sort of feel yeah okay mm -hmm. but again either one of like you like knew there were going to be mark have artifacts here well that's the thing give me a uh knowledge culture or if you have an knowledge archaeology uh those would work uh which culture um what do you got i have Kiwin culture, Narn culture, Centauri culture, Minbari culture, Burkiri culture, and Pakmaran culture. Pick one. Wow. <laughs> All right. Tell me which one you're picking, though. Uh, I, I, it doesn't really matter. They're all the same score. Um, but I need to know which one you're choosing to use. I'll start with Pakmaran. Okay. 27. 27. Okay. Yes. There are a number of ancient Pakmara artifacts in here. Not like, oh my god, everywhere, but more of like you look around and go, huh. Well, here is something that's attributed to an ancient librarian from about 4,000 years ago. Oh, look, here's something that it looks like was a scroll or whatever the equivalent there is in uh, Pakmara society. Uh, actually, I could I could kind of see a scroll done in human, uh, done in skin, but that's a different story. No, uh, that wouldn't happen. That's wasteful. Yeah, I didn't figure yeah, that's what I was thinking too. It's like it's wasteful, right? But again, it's like it would be, you know, tablets and things like this in the po ancient Pakmara language, not unlike what you guys saw from the library when investigating uh, the stone seeds and the stone shapers, where you got an amber tablet back that also described the shape that happened to be the first and the last outpost. Our. Are Jerry and Melinda with us right now? Yes, they are. As is Kaluta, by the way. Yes, well, uh, he he's not really an ask for permission. He's more of a do what you want, and he's there when you ask for forgiveness type. Anyway, um, <laughs> kind of 
Pardon me? May I examine that scroll? You, uh, they look over. Oh, yes. The Pakmara essay on... What was it again? Uh, Melinda looks over. I'm not entirely certain. Though, if you would be so kind as to tell us what the writing's about, we would consider it a, a fair trade. And he kind of motions you to, to take a look. I would be delighted to disseminate information. So um, I'm not going to have you roll for anything else like that. But as you read it, it is an ancient form of, of Pakmara language. I mean, like really ancient, not quite cuneiform, but you get the idea. Yeah. But it is all ideas about visitors and uh, dream shapers from beyond the stars. Evidence. This is like the first major evidence that Pakmara had been visited 4,000 years ago. Uh-huh. And I don't know the, I can't remember the exact history of the Pakmara. You probably know it better than I do because you've probably read the book more than I have about when they were in theory supposed to be, uh, had found uh, space travel and had become uh, a race unto themselves. Oh, you are vastly overestimating my ability to remember that stuff. Um... That's okay. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll play with that, but as we discover um, more later, you get these are ideas and images rather than actual facts. So, But basically, yes, it looked like some of the ancient first ones, in, you know, not just the Vorlons or the Shadows, but somebody else had visited Pakmara eons ago and that they had laid down some of the foundations years ago and actually found the place to be a... Um, Oh, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, uninhabitable. <laughs> uninhabitable <laughs> asterisk. Exactly. Well, uninhabitable for them. They didn't see the purpose in it. Though they did find a strange group of people that were there and had just enough knowledge to write something. And that's when uh, literally a piece of, in modern telling, as you kind of read this, translating him from and so the, they descended from the heavens and grant to unto us this you know great blessing which served to turn our entire society around um whatever the ancient being was something fell off their ship it was like literally like a coke can got shoved out the window and yet whatever it was was so developed it helped accelerate the technological evolution of the pot bra four thousand years ago Shouldn't litter. <laughs> Sorry? Ah, uh, yes. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Which, by the way, if anyone knows what I'm referring to, uh, I hate to you say it, but I You are referring to The Gods Must Be Crazy. Yes, I am. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. But yes, basically, same sort of situation happened to Pacmara eons ago. And this is the first evidence that this is actually recorded. Because this is an ancient tablet, you'd have to, you know, scan it with everything else, get a half-life, all the rest of that to get its ancient and exact date. Uh, but this looks like it was, you know, again, to use the human equivalent, Babylonian. You know, you know, to say something like they took the bubble off their heads and underneath was entirely a new face that, you know, is shown onto us. Oh, it was the astronaut. They took the helmet off. And this is the, wow, this is absolutely fascinating. So you're seeing some of this, and I'm assuming you're telling them uh, what you found out, yes? Oh, yes. Okay. And they cut, one of them actually just kind of uh, immediately just takes out a, a pad and just starts typing away, recording what you're saying, but not looking down the pad. They're just, you know, tap, 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 tap. Oh, after these are people after my own heart. Um, and then when they're done, they actually say, he passes the pad to another person and says, get this in the records, please. Yes, sir. Absolutely. Move off. Oh, Mira has made some friends this day. <laughs> Which, okay. But yes, he said, now, while you were here, I believe you were asking questions about uh, the various factions above and how to deal with them. And I think we found something here. He goes over to one of the shelves, pulls out not just this huge book. I mean, this, like, again, leather-bound book, like giant tome. And when he, you know, again, puts it on the desk, it's not so much a place, it's more of a thump. No matter what, you know, where you actually place it in the desk from, it's going to hit with a thump. It's one of those books. Uh, I mean, but, yeah, right. that's, that's one of the qualifying properties of a tome. <laughs> he then brings out something that looks not unlike a desk lamp with a crane neck, 
but it has, again, something closer to that light magnifying glass thing in the middle, but it doesn't look right. It doesn't look like he's pulling out a magnifying glass to, you know, do anything underneath it. But, and whatever this is made of, you think it's made of some sort of bronze, but it's a bronze that doesn't look right. It, again, looks like somebody had come up with bronze from someplace else. Um, and he kind of adjusts this. He adjusts the circle. There's little etched runes, if you will, all around the circle. He adjusts it right, this, that. He places it, ah, here we are. And then he opens the book underneath it. The book emanates with light. And he looks down on the book. Interestingly enough, uh, as the book emanates with light, I'll need to notice checks from both of you again, please. And do. 34 oh, nice. oh. Dude, yeah, I have more... no idea what's going on. Yeah, <laughs> you're, so you're, sort of, you're just kind of in shock because here's a person who opened up a book of light with a magnifying glass over it. <laughs> Whereas, Mirgret, you notice not only is there the book of light, but again, the lighting in the room darkens like somebody again turned the, the knob on a, on a display. And the actual disc lens the guy's looking through that jerry's looking through also darkens in a particular way and it the light around it emits something that's closer to red you know it just kind of hums out this little not even infrared but just kind of red being pushed down into it so so he's he, using it as a decoder ring kind of yeah when he looks over he says ah okay so we have some information regarding the Yithians. Now, we've been able to find quite a number of information here, but he looks around. Now, from what we can find, this is one of the battle plans to deal with, and you can kind of see him wanting to spit on the ground, but he can't say, he can't spit, and he can't say the word, and he just says, this is their battle plan for dealing with the others that looked like there was some sort of escape plan. They figured out that the others had surrounded the planet and waited for the planet's sun to go nova to take the planet with it. They actually had brought several um, vessels to make sure that the Yith could not venture off their world you know, to keep them there. Um, there's also some... He kind of flips through the pages like he's reading... Uh, Encyclopedia Britannica. It's like, oh, there's some pages here on propaganda. We are the chosen race, yada, yada, yada. But then it talks about temporal displacements, which is, I think, what you guys have been experiencing. Is this correct? It is indeed. Ah, good. Yeah. So, but that's the problem with, um, with temporal displacements. You can't think linearly. Nor can you think two-dimensionally. You have to think five-dimensionally. Okay. Because Claire looks really confused. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I have a quick question. Go for it. Do, when, when he says can't, does that mean it is you are... Does that mean with temporal displacement you, you become unable to think two-dimensionally or linearly? Or... With temporal displacement, it is required that you be able to think five-dimensional. Oh, um, I'll assume for the moment that you actually asked something like that in the mirror grad voice, because that's going to be the best way to explain this. Oh, okay. Hang on. I'll, I will ask it in the mirror grad voice. Go for it. Beg your pardon? When you say that, you, that one cannot think linearly or two-dimensionally while experiencing temporal displacement... Do you mean that one is unable to think linearly or two-dimensionally, or simply that one must be able to think five-dimensionally? Mel Melinda is actually the one who starts smiling. You have to think five-dimensionally, five dimensionally, then you're going to defeat them. But does this mean that they are incapable of thinking two-dimensionally? It is a good question. Because, again, what is time to beings that can jump back and forth. I think we covered this in Arrival. Mm-hmm. Exactly. <laughs> Which, uh, many, many issues with that movie, yeah. So, but anyway, but yes, they, they look over and says, 
you have to think five dimensionality when you want to defeat them. What is time to these people? They come in and out. This is a series of doorways that can affect one after the other. They actually look, uh, Jerry doesn't even look up. He says, from what we've heard from that young lad, um, Tuvo, uh, I believe there was an incident where one of the Yithians was able to procure a number of numbers for a roulette wheel. Is this correct? And how do you think they got the numbers for the roulette, roulette wheel? I have no memory of this incident. Should I? No, actually, no. you wouldn't, because that was all tied. about it. Um, yeah, like, um, I guess two maybe might have known about it. Like, maybe someone mentioned it to him at some point. Not Ty, but someone else, but... Um, yeah. Yeah, Ty did not tell anybody about that. I would assume that it's because of their ability to see time, not simply as a linear process, but as a whole from which they are able to pick out certain points of salient information. Therefore, if they are currently physically manifesting at one point in time, but they have knowledge of other points in time, they would be able to use their knowledge of other points in time to relay that information to the current point of time that they are inhabiting. He looks up and goes, very good. He has that kind of, not quite, I'm impressed, but more of the, you know, ha, huh, bravo. I did not have to explain things. Good. Yeah, because I'm a uh, librarian, motherfucker. <laughs> <laughs> and that is our bumper sticker for today. Um <laughs> By the way, I actually have friends who are librarians, and if I had that made into a bumper sticker, I think they'd buy it. <laughs> so, because, yes, that is the issue we have to deal with. Because, let's just say you were to, oh, I don't know, gather them all together in the church for whatever reason, and then gas them, let's say, and then or pump plasma into the whole facility. They would die, but would they? Or would they just revert back to where they went to and found another body to jump in a different direction for? So they I suppose are... that depends on whether or not they're able to to gather the relevant information in time. Exactly. Theoretically, the issue is not that we will do something that they are unable to gather the information for from a future point in the time stream, but then we will do so in such a way as that they will not be gathering, they will not think to gather that information before we have been able to execute our plan. So in other words, if we do not think five dimensionality, we have to rely on surprise and total obliteration. No, what I am saying is that we will not be able to have surprise unless we are able to think five dimensionally because we must be able to figure out a way in which we can carry out our plan such that it will take place at a point in, a t in the time stream that they will not think to gather information from. You know, Ty would just tell them that they can only travel one way in time and once they get here they're stuck because of how they set up time travel, but nobody asked her. <laughs> You're not even in the room! You I know that. that. I'm just pointing that out. Yeah, I was about to say, this would be the great this conversation is... to have with Ty, because Ty is the only person of the entire group who has experienced this, but it's around. You, you, you would think uh, they would call her right quick and be like, so, <laughs> can they travel more than one way in time? She'd be like, no, I'm pretty sure I've told you this already. I mean, intern Tuvo also knows this, but he is also not on this field trip. Exactly. Because well, yeah. Ty would find his permission slip. Because he's also, a child. Yeah, Ty, I mean, you are, and Ty, you're in Edlin's ship, which doesn't get signal. Remember? So oh, yeah. we can't call you even if we wanted to. Mm. So, so in this case, they've got to come up with their own theories, their own ideas, and see whether or not how bad it goes. Da -da -da. Oh, <laughs> good luck with I that. I hear the phrase. Well, it was nice knowing you guys. Uh, guys busy eating cookies. I think in this case, our wisest course of action would be to consult with the people who have been, who have gone through the particular time stream that the Yithians are using. Hmm. Fascinating idea. Tell me more. One of my interns is currently inhabiting a body that is not his original body because he was used as, as one of the time replacements for the Yithians. So, he has traveled both back and forth. I believe his insights will be invaluable when coming up with a way to manipulate our actions such that they are not 
visible to the Yithians who are using the time stream. Hmm. Very intriguing. Very intriguing. Now, we have had talks with both... Excuse me. We've had talks with both Tuvo and uh, Wagner, I believe, was the other name, wasn't it? Oh, yes, the one who was the Rikiri female who wanted to become a human male. Yes, 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 that, 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 that one. Yes, we've had discussions with them uh, when we offered them the, the bargains. And so, but yes, they too would also be people to discuss this matter with. Though Tuvo more, knew more about the Kulati at the time. That was his bargaining chip. Hmm, tempting, tempting. Well, I am explicitly going to refrain from mentioning that my intern is Tuvo. Fair enough. <laughs> I just want, I want that on record. Yeah, mm. you, you're mentioning there's a person you know, but you're not naming names. You're following HIPAA, pro HIPAA protocol. Yeah, I'm like these fools who did an unlicensed medical procedure on an actual literal child. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Now remember, okay, um, oh god, you don't have culture that, nor do you have uh, any forms of psychology. Uh, what was the, do a sense motive real quick. Okay. Oh, what culture are you out? Oh, in this case, it would be shadow agent. So, no, you don't Oh, have. yeah, no, I don't. <laughs> okay, sense motive. Oh, that's not a good one. All right, it's fine. <laughs> yeah, we know you did that. Eight. Oh, okay. So, yeah. You can stand with your own beliefs about that and just kind of run with it. So, no problem. Yes. Yeah, so, they said, hmm, perhaps these two would be people to discuss. Uh, I would not trust the the descriptions imparted by Wagner. I am familiar with this individual. He failed out of my internship program. Ah. So, would you know how to contact them? Considering they would be somewhere on the vessel, I'm assuming. I have not I have no contact with Wagner. Mm. And the, uh, very well. Um, we'll send out agents for this and see if we can make a, a deal or two to get him in. I believe there's still things he wants. Particularly, he closes the Book of Light, goes over to a cabinet, kind of ruffles through a few things, and then he goes, ah, this. Pulls out another book, and then this, oh, God, I'm not it looks initially like a large pen case uh, or actually the better, better thing would be, you know, those um, roll up things that artists put uh, put brushes into. Yes, I do. I have I, I used to use one for knitting needles. OK, yeah. So he's got something like that and this this book and uh, go ahead and make culture human role. Dooley, you can do the same if you have uh, knowledge human knowledge culture human. 25. Actually, I do. Let me um, find out what my role is. Oh, not very much, but I have it. No. Okay, so yeah, oh, Julie, you yeah. don't have it. No, I was, I'm still <sighs> lost. That's okay. With the other things that had happened up until recently, this is the first time that you did not beat out Becca for the role. So there's a part of me that's like the, I was expecting you to roll a natural 20 and for, uh, you know, Dooley to know exactly what is being pulled out, this bizarre esoteric thing. And then everyone has to stop and look at Dooley. Dooley has to do something like, well, you know, you, you, you see this sort of stuff in the underworld. But I can't do that. Because <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, so this I okay. did not roll well at all, which is fine because I'm going up against a librarian who knows lots of stuff. Exactly. So. In this particular case, though, while you're not exactly sure of the exact purpose, you do know what has been procured because a, cer a certain couple of names have popped up. Now, I'm having to bluff because, again, I can only do so much. But when he unrolls the uh, brush case, what you find are small sticks, some of wood, some of brass, some of silver, some of zinc each that are or uh, uh have uh ornate in you know inscriptions on them some of them have jewels embedded some of them are highly carved uh just you know laid out in this way but the entire roll itself is uh black 
but it's painted with these gold images. Now, again, the gold looks like it's been faded a couple of years, no problem with that. But the images tend to be things like uh, runes, hieroglyphs, sim image, images like that. The book that's been pulled out is a, um, well, it's, I'll, I'll bluff a little bit, is a, it looks like some sort of leather bound tome by someone called Aberlin the, uh, Abraham the Mage. Ah, uh, they're Wiccans, aren't they? <laughs> well, if uh, give me an intelligence check. <laughs> Three. Three. Okay, you have no idea. Uh, what? No, I came in way okay. below my intelligence. Thank you. Sorry, I I did the scratch that reverse that for a second. Wrong way. Yep. Uh, so in this case, it's not so much that they're Wiccans. You went, oh right, Wagner mentioned as your intern that when he was researching the Yithians, he had gotten his hands on a tome when he was uh, living in the 1800s, in the 19th century. Um, he was a researcher of occult phenomena and studies at the time, which is how he managed to get his hands on the Book of Light and became a Yithian, and was also that promise of new knowledge. This is a much older than 19th century uh, occult book with a cult paraphernalia. So, what do they have? They have a bargaining chip. Nice. Because what is, what is the eternal question of the shadows? What do you want? And here's something they think he might want. Excellent. So, now we just have to find him amongst and they kind of wave, you know, their hands around amongst all this. But I believe he'll be willing to trade for this. And he looks over. We did get this transcribed, processed, everything like that. Another person says, oh, yes, sir. Everything's been documented, analyzed, scanned. The doctor has been very helpful with this. Ah, oh, very good. Very good. Oh, and the other two? Oh, they're, they're insane with this. But yes, they've done all the documentation. Good, good, good. Well, he just kind of literally like goes under the desk, pulls out essentially a briefcase, pops it open, Puts the book, puts the roll of, of uh, sticks in there, closes the briefcase, holds it up. Well, shall we go find Wagner? Are they asking us? Yes. I believe I will be more of a hindrance in your search than a help. We did not part on, on amiable terms, given our, our, my termination of his internship. <laughs> they look over and say, ah, you it's ate him. Big shit. Do you have an idea? I did not eat him. If I had, I would know exactly where to find him. <laughs> Which then goes into Dooley's question. It's a big ship. Do you know how to find him? Um, well, <laughs> don't. However, there's only so many places he could be, particularly if one of, they turn to Dooley, one of the security personnel who has access to more features than we do, say. Hmm. Well, we'd have to go back up to the security, a security station somewhere, in order for me to do that. In that case, I believe we will leave the room as is, though he does, he looks over and he does say something in a bizarre language. If anybody wants to make a linguistics check, I do. To do so. Yeah. <laughs> While she's rolling, every now and then when they're talking, do we just kind of resist the urge to shudder, like when dealing with something slimy or very unpleasant? Mm -hmm. <laughs> 17. Okay. So it is an unusual language that is a lot of interesting syllables and clicks. Uh, but you can't translate it. You have no idea. But it just sounds like from the cadence that he's giving orders. And people respond with kind of the affirmative, understood, uh, will commence sort of responses that you understand. But other than that, you don't know what the, the people are actually saying. But yes, for Julie, this has been... Oh, yeah. By the way, Julie, you're welcome to point this out to anybody after a bit. Uh, you know exactly who these people are. They're ex-shadow agents. They basically are people who work for the devil. And... <laughs> Yeah. Here's Miragrak yeah. helpfully going, oh, right, the devil. Do you have his real name? Um, yeah, 
Dooley has basically gone into the, I have to deal with it, but I'm not going to do it voluntarily. So like simple answers, trying to come up with reasons not to do things. Um, you know, I don't know if Mirgrat would pick up on this, but that combined with the must not shudder and wash my hands 50 times. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, I think Mirgrat's just going to assume that's because of the corpse smell. <laughs> like Mugra has is putting all of their cultural sensitivity training to use and is like, ah yes, people who are not Pakmara don't like the smell of decomposing bodies. Actually, this I is I mean a it's not pleasant, but I've dealt with Pakmara enough that I've had a little exposure. I'm sorry, Dan, this is a great opportunity. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. You guys were talking, it was great. No. But I was I was about to say this is a great opportunity for an interesting situation. Uh do uh Mirgrat, I will need a sense motive check. Duh, I know that's a bad one. Yeah, it is. 16. Okay. Um, and Dooley, I'll need a bluff check from you. Okay, I really have the, Oh, I do have it. Okay, let me... Yeah, I mean, because I'm not trying to be obviously rude, but I'm... Very nice. Exactly. Uh, 14. Okay, so yeah. In that case, since your bluff was less than the sense motive, you're being very polite, as far as you can tell, but the feeling of I want to have a Brillo pad bath is something that Mirgrat can pick up on. Now again, Mirgrat could assume that's part of the smell, it's part of the death, it's part of the whatever, but it, I will say this, at least Mirgrat has probably picked up on the idea that it's not just that. You don't know what it is, but it's not just that. Before you leave on this expedition, may I have a moment to confer with my associate? Uh, they actually look over and says, well, uh, he, then uh, Molly actually says, oh, is the closet empty? And when somebody nods, they say, ah, oh, yes. Uh, they kind of usher you towards one of the other side closets. You may confer in there. You. That is most considerate of you. Uh, so Mirgrat's gonna hustle Dooley into the closet. Okay. <laughs> okay. Holy acolyte Dooley! I sense that you are uncomfortable with something. Uh, yeah, a lot of things. I I don't really want to go off with these people by myself because they're very bad people. I see. Would you be more comfortable if you were accompanied by Kaluta? Uh, well, yes and no. <clears throat> I don't want to leave you alone. I see. I, I, it, it, hmm. I mean, these, these people serve the shadow. I mean, that's pretty much as evil as you can if you don't quite believe in the whole good and evil thing, they're basically extremely self-serving to the point where your existence doesn't matter unless they can use it to their specific advantage and only at that moment. Yes, I have also met the Centauri. <laughs> oh, no, no. These guys are worse than the Centauri. <laughs> Sorry. I don't even know if that should be canon. Uh, <laughs> Run with it. Run with it. Yes, uh, these, but... these guys are worse than the Centauri. I believe that. However, if we are assessing based on potential threat rather than on morality, I think you will find that the shadows are no longer an active threat. However, the Kulati and the Yikians are very much an active threat. I believe the yeah. phrase that we are talking about is the smaller of two evils. In this case, it would be the smallest of three evils. Well, yes, I'm not so much worried about the shadow themselves. I'm just worried about the fact that these people have been trained by, you know, what used to be a big evil and may still have their habits. But you're right. The Athians and the bug people are very much an active threat. <sighs> I would also but say that we are not strangers to, the, to individuals with mercenary interests. I do not think that these association members are in fact any more mercenary than, say, the IPX 
individuals who swindled you and Ty. Hmm. So how do you want to break up people? I mean, I, I need to go to a security station in order to do what they want to do, even though I don't really want to do anything for them. Um, you want to stay here. I shall contact the Puck Murat delegation and request the assistance of several research assistants. They shall meet me down here, at which point we shall go through their archives looking for any information on the Yithians. We can use this information to better refine our tests to weed out potential Yithians from the people that we moved to Babylon Crystal. In this way, I shall not be alone or unaccompanied, and also you will be able to take Kaluta with you as a bodyguard. That's a good solution. Thank you. You are most right. welcome. And normally, well, I would we'll tell you to roll a, uh, a influence check on this, but I'm not. Since we haven't been using influence that much anyway, I'm just gonna run with it. Uh, I mean, <laughs> I, I feel like uh, if you want me to roll an influence check, I can. Uh, but I will say my Pakmara civility influence bonus uh, (parentheses political) is twenty three. Yeah. Plus, that's probably increased because you're like the diplomat de facto or something. Oh, yeah. yeah. And I'm also the head of the of the Pakmara diplomatic delegation. Yes, yeah. as the original so. diplomat has died. <laughs> That'll so, happen. <laughs> but, yeah, so I don't think getting a few Pakmara down here to help me, like, sort through artifacts and, and look for clues about the Yithians is going to be difficult. Okay. It would be kind of like you saying to me, I need to go to a fabric store and someone needs to advise me. Tori, are you up for this? <laughs> like, <laughs> this is what they do and they enjoy it. So, <laughs> Incidentally, if you are ever in Montreal, Tori, uh, I will take you to the fabric stores here. Uh, we have some really cool ones. I think I just found a reason to go to Montreal. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I was about to say, what is that I hear? Is that the sound of Tori getting her passport up to date? Uh, <laughs> I mean, we are planning a trip to Minnesota this year, so it's not that far from, I mean, it's what, 10, 12 hour drive? I Maybe? don't know. I've never, I've never been to Minnesota. Well, Manitoba's a of us, I think, right? Montreal's to the oh, north, right? it's going to be it's very gonna be bad at geography. Long. It's going to be way okay, longer so it's, than that. It's a day. Uh, it's a, it is a seven to eight hour drive to Toronto. And oh, okay. so, uh, yeah, it's going to be, yeah. it's going to be more than 10 hours. Okay. Well, yeah. Time to get the passport, uh, passport up to date. So, uh, now again, you come out of the closet and I don't joke here. Um, but, <laughs> <laughs> um, the Pak Moran and Narin come out of the closet. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, now to your plan of inviting, uh, basically getting uh, a Pak Moran contingent of researchers to come in. This is something that you discuss with Jerry or Melinda? Yes. Okay. I will need a diplomacy check. Okay. Uh, I'm... Could I make my uh, my pitch to them to see if I can get a bonus on my diplomacy check based on the way I sell it? I will give you a bonus if you can if you sell it to me. Okay. <clears throat> I believe that we have come to an agreement on how we should proceed from from this point. As previously mentioned, you said that it is imperative to be able to think five-dimensionally to be able to outpace the Yithians at their own game. Yeah. In order to accomplish this, I would like to spend additional time researching some of the materials that you have here on the Yithian. In order to expedite this process, I would like to invite several of my Pakmara colleagues to act as research assistants. In this way, I will not be slowing down any of your cataloging efforts by using the resources that you currently have. Additionally, once we have scanned and synthesized the information, we will be happy to add it to your catalog of all of the information that you are compiling based on the artifacts you've collected. Okay. Uh, that would have been one of our um, caveats. 
So go ahead and give me a diplomacy check. Okay. Uh... Oh, oh no. <sighs> oh, oops, I did the wrong thing here. <laughs> Don't call that happen. Okay, <laughs> so <laughs> you gave a good presentation to me, and I'm giving you a bonus because, again, and you still rolled a one, so uh, um, let's just say something was lost in translation. What? What was lost in translation? Ah, it's a good mystery, yes? So if you want to know the answer to this, you have to join us again next time for Odyssey. A Babylon 5 story. In the meantime, I have to go talk to my professionals about acting professionals. <sighs> you earthers and your strange humor. Whatever. Now will you explain it to me again? And that's where we're in for this week. I want to thank everyone for joining us and hope that you continue to join us every two weeks for another episode of Odyssey. If you have any questions, comments, constructive criticisms, or just want to say hi, then you can find us at temporalplaygrounds.com slash odyssey or email us at temporalplaygrounds at gmail.com or find us on Facebook, Odyssey, a Babylon 5 RPG podcast or Reddit, r slash odyssey b5. Babylon 5 was created by J. Michael Straczynski and is owned by Warner Brothers Domestic Media. The Babylon 5 role-playing game was produced by Mongoose Publishing utilizing the OGL gaming license for D20. Our audio engineer is Gabriel Belden. Our theme music, Titan Striker, was composed by Evan King. Incidental music provided by Tabletop Audio at tabletopaudio.com. All other music provided by Creative Commons license and is available of information on our website. Once again, I am Daniel, and I thank you for joining us on this grand adventure. Good night, and keep dreaming.